Welcome back to LabRat Scientific. Now in this short video, I'm going to discuss the basics of rocket trajectories. Now there are primarily two types of trajectories, orbital trajectories and suborbital rocket trajectories. Now I'm going to focus on suborbital rocket flight. Here is the basic shape of a suborbital trajectory. The rocket flies up to apogee and then falls back and hits the Earth at the end of the flight. Here is an orbital trajectory. Once the rocket gets into space, it follows a circular or elliptical flight path that circles the Earth. While it's common to say that there is zero g in orbit, that's not really correct. In fact, gravity is what keeps the spacecraft circling the Earth. If there are no gravity in orbit, the spacecraft would simply fly away out into deep space. Now, suborbital trajectories can be higher than orbital trajectories. The key to reaching orbit is velocity, not altitude. A spacecraft needs to achieve a velocity of about 17,500 miles per hour in order to stay in Earth orbit. The spacecraft in orbit is always falling towards the Earth due to the gravitational pull, but the 17,500 mile per hour speed allows adequate horizontal distance to be traveled so the flight path matches the curvature of the Earth. Now that's enough about orbits. The focus of this video is on suborbital trajectories. Unguided suborbital trajectories have a parabolic shape since most of the flight is outside the Earth's atmosphere. On the other hand, a model rocket's trajectory is not quite a pure parabola due to the fact the flight is entirely inside the atmosphere and under the influence of drag. This is what the velocity looks like over the trajectory. The thrust accelerates the rocket, causing the velocity to increase. Maximum velocity is usually achieved just before motor burnout. After burnout, drag and gravity begins to slow the rocket. Apogee, the highest point in flight, is where velocity is at a minimum. There tends to always be some horizontal velocity, so the rocket never really stops moving. After apogee, gravity pulls the rocket back down towards the ground, increasing its speed. As the rocket speeds up, the drag force increases. And in many cases, the drag grows to a value that's equal to the rocket's weight, and acceleration becomes zero. This is known as terminal velocity. After this point, the rocket will not speed up anymore. Now, before we move on, we need to understand the difference between body attitude and velocity vector. Now, the body attitude is the angle between the local horizontal and the long axis of the rocket. Now, the long axis of the rocket is represented by this black arrow, and the local horizontal is represented by this purple dashed line. So the body attitude is the angle between the black arrow and the local horizontal. Now the velocity vector is a line that represents the direction the rocket is actually moving, and it's represented by this green arrow. And the flight elevation is the angle between the velocity vector and the local horizontal. Now in some cases, the body attitude will equal the velocity vector, but in many cases it won't. Now let's take a closer look at the flight path angle. Now, as a reminder, the flight path angle is the angle between the velocity vector and the local horizontal. Now, the flight path angle can be referenced to the vertical or the horizontal. Now, in this lesson, I reference the flight path angle to the local horizontal. The term local horizontal is used because if the flight covers a significant distance, the curvature of the Earth causes the horizontal to change. Horizontal means parallel to the Earth's surface. That's shown here in this representation. Here the local horizontal is horizontal in this picture, but if I travel far enough around the Earth, you'll see that the local horizontal changes. Now, the flight path angle is positive on the up leg, so measuring from the local horizontal, I measure upwards to the velocity vector. Now on the down leg, it'll tend to be negative. That means I'm measuring from the local horizontal downward to the velocity vector. Now let's take a look at the difference between flight path angle and body angle. Now first we'll look at a model rocket flight. So here's my rocket flying along its trajectory. And what you'll see is in the model rocket, the body elevation is going to be equal to the flight path angle. And that's because the rocket is flying inside the atmosphere. So there are always aerodynamic forces acting on the fins that keep the rocket aligned with the velocity vector. Now if we look at a sounding rocket flight, or a rocket that flies outside the atmosphere for most of the flight, it's not quite the same. 
The velocity vector will be aligned to the body angle while it's flying through the atmosphere, just like in the model rocket. But once the rocket leaves the atmosphere, there are no longer any aerodynamic forces that make the rocket align the body to the velocity vector. So the rocket will maintain a constant body elevation, and that does not equal the velocity vector. However, when the rocket hits the atmosphere, provided it still has its fins, it will ultimately realign the body elevation to the velocity vector. Now to a simple demonstration using this air rocket to demonstrate the concepts of flight elevation and body elevation. Now I'm ready to do the experiment here. Now I superimpose this parabola onto the video and I set it just a little bit higher than the rocket so you can still see the rocket and then compare the body attitude relative to the shape of this curve. Now this curve represents essentially the velocity vector and the body attitude will be the body angle. Let's go ahead and Run the video and stop it. Here you can see uh, the body attitude of the rocket and it's pretty well parallel to the velocity vector in this case. Now here in your Apogee, same sort of thing. Here you can see the body attitude of the rocket. And again, it's pretty well parallel to the velocity vector on the parabola. And here, past Apogee, same thing. Here's the rocket body and pretty well parallel to the trajectory. And as it leaves the frame here, you can see it's pretty well parallel to the parabola. So again, that proves out that for a suborbital trajectory inside the atmosphere, the body attitude will parallel the velocity vector. Now let's take a look at the effect of launch angle on the altitude and range of a rocket trajectory. Now, if I have a large launcher angle, and that's the angle between the horizontal and the uh, body of the rocket. And let's say we're about 85 degrees in this case. You'll see the rocket will fly along this purple trajectory. However, if I lower the launcher and launch at a smaller launch angle, you'll see that I have a different trajectory. As I bring the launcher elevation down, the apogee will decrease, but the impact range will increase. If I decrease the launcher angle even further, the apogee drops even further, and the impact range grows. Now, maximum range is achieved when I launch at a 45 degree launch angle. And maximum apogee is achieved when I launch the rocket straight up. Now, let's do an experiment to demonstrate this. So what I have is a bilge pump connected to a 12 volt battery and it goes on and off when I push the button. Now, if I submerge the pump into a container of water and I fire the water up at a high launch angle, you'll see the water follows this particular trajectory. Now, if I decrease the launch angle, you'll see the water follows this different trajectory. You'll see that the apogee is lower and the range is longer. And again, lowering the elevation even further, you'll see that I have yet another trajectory with a lower apogee and a larger impact range. Well, Hopefully this short little video gave you some insights on rocket trajectories. Now remember, you can go to labratscientific.com and get more information on rocket flight and other topics. Well, I hope to see you next time on Labrat Scientific.